If you're interested in poker strategy, undoubtedly you've heard about an unbeatable style of play known as Game Theory Optimal, or GTO for short. But if you're new to GTO, you've likely been confused by all the fancy terms and complicated programs and charts that are often used when discussing this topic. So in this video, we're going to outline in a very simple way how virtually every single GTO strategy is constructed. We should start out by highlighting the sole and solitary goal of all GTO strategies, which is to maximize chips. GTO is simply a scientific method to do just that. It focuses on choosing the action for each hand in each scenario that is most likely to win the most chips. So what does that mean as a practical matter? Well, to make things a bit easier to digest, let's categorize the types of hands you may get in poker as strong, medium, or weak, and start with our strongest hands, which will often include things like full houses, flushes, straights, sets, two pairs, over pairs, and strong top pairs. The primary source of winning chips in poker is by playing large pots when we have hands like these. And so when we have a strong hand, we'll often want to bet or raise over multiple streets. However, if we only bet and raise our strong hands, at some point, discerning opponents will stop calling us with worse. Right, in a live environment, we've all played against old man coffee that has a 5% VPIP and only shows down with aces, kings, queens, and ace king, and we quickly learn to avoid this guy once he starts betting big. And online, figuring out if our opponents are only betting strong hands is even easier through the use of heads-up displays. So, in order to induce our opponents to call our bets when we're holding a strong hand, we need to also sometimes bet with our weak hands, also known as bluffs. And bluffing also has the extra potential benefit of getting our opponent to fold a better hand. But if you've played poker for a while, you've probably noticed that you will typically have a weak hand much more often than you'll have a strong hand. This means that you can't just bluff every time you're holding a weak hand, or else your discerning opponents will catch on to this and start taking stands by calling down lighter. So the next question is, how do you decide when to bluff and when not to bluff? Well, you could just flip a coin and that strategy would probably actually be okay, but there's an even better way. You can differentiate between your weak hands by their specific characteristics or micro attributes. This may include deciding to bluff with a good draw, which we refer to as incremental equity, but choosing not to bluff with pure air. For example, on this turn, we could decide to bluff if we're holding Queen 10 of Diamonds, but choose to just give up if we're holding a 7 of Hearts, because we have a much higher chance to hit a big hand and win a big pot with the former due to its incremental equity. We can also choose to bluff when our particular holding makes it more likely that villain will fold from a probability standpoint, which we refer to as card removal. So on this river, we may choose to bluff with Ace of Diamonds, 10 of Clubs, but choose to give up with Ace of Hearts, 10 of Clubs, because when we're holding the Ace of Diamonds, it makes it impossible for our opponents to have the nut flush, which in turn increases the probability that we'll get a fold due to our hand's card removal effects. When you balance betting strong and weak hands in this way, it puts Villain in a predicament. If he has the nuts, then defending is easy. But what about his medium hands, such as second and lower pairs, and perhaps strong ace highs? If Hero only bets strong hands, then Villain can comfortably just fold all his medium hands, and if Hero bets all his weak hands, Villain can just comfortably call all his medium hands. But if Hero starts balancing his bets among strong and weak hands, then Villain is forced to call some medium hands and fold others. If he doesn't, then Hero would be able to readjust just by either under or over bluffing. So how does Villain decide which medium hands to call and which to fold? Well again, he could just flip a coin, but similar to the bluffing situation, Villain can improve his chances for calling or folding correctly by choosing hands that have positive incremental equity or card removal properties. For example, facing an all-in shove for our tournament life, we may decide to call with pocket 4s but fold with 10-9 because holding the 10 reduces the probability that Villain is holding a bluff like 10-9. 7, 10, 8, Queen 10, or King 10, for example. So now that we've talked about what Hero should do with his strong and weak hands, what about his medium hands? Well, since hands in this category generally will have a decent but not great chance to be ahead of Villain, they generally do not want to play for a big pot, and will often be comfortable checking down and just scooping what went into the middle preflop. 
So these middling hands can often be played either way, as a bet or check, often depending on incremental equity. However, since we just mentioned that our strong hands usually want to bet over multiple streets, if we take a passive strategy only with our medium hands and the weak hands that we give up, our discerning opponents would know that when we check, the likelihood of us holding a strong hand is zero or very low, and he could leverage this information to apply maximum pressure against us, making our lives miserable. So to protect our passive lines, we can start to also play passively with some of our strong hands, also known as slow playing or trapping, which sometimes also has the benefit of allowing our opponents to make a hand he likes on later streets, whereas if we just bet, he might just fold. So how do we determine which strong hands to bet and which strong hands to slow play with? Again, we could just flip a coin, but even better, we could choose to slow play our hands that 1. don't need much protection and or 2. that block villains calling range. So for example, we may decide to c-bet with pocket jacks, but check pocket aces because jacks could benefit from protection from overcards on turns and rivers, whereas aces do not need this same protection on this dry board that villain likely did not connect with. Or in this river scenario, we may decide to slow play pocket kings, but bet pocket fives, because holding two kings makes it much less likely that villain has top pair, or in other words, our hand blocks top pair, which is a calling hand, whereas a pair of fives is not. And that is about it. What we've just described in a nutshell is essentially how every single GTO strategy is constructed. It doesn't matter if it's heads up, full ring, MTT, or cash. GTO is mainly about maximizing our chips by balancing our strong, medium, and weak hands in a way that makes our holdings and strategies very disguised and difficult, if not impossible, to take advantage of. And the key in terms of a practical application of GTO all comes down to combo selection knowing which hands to fit within which bucket depending on its specific characteristics. But before we conclude this video, we should note a few caveats about GTO. First, notice how we discussed the need to balance our range in the context of facing a discerning opponent. In contrast, if your opponent is not paying attention to what you're doing, then you can usually throw balance completely out the window, which is referred to as exploitative play. Second, even if your opponents are discerning, a practical real-life application of GTO doesn't require perfect balance. It requires just enough balance so that your strategies are not face up. Quote unquote true GTO strategies are calculated by a computer playing a single hand against itself billions of times over. But in real life, you aren't playing the same hand billions of times against your opponents, which means that even if you don't find balance in one particular hand, it probably won't matter as long as you maintain some semblance of balance over the long run. Additionally, when the computer plays against itself, it is clairvoyant. That is, it knows the exact probability of hands its opponent can have and how frequently it takes each action. But your real life opponents aren't clairvoyant. Some may not have even graduated high school, so you don't have to worry as much about maintaining a perfectly balanced strategy. And finally, although the overall premise of GTO is relatively simple and straightforward, the execution of it is not. Knowing how to optimally balance your strategy can be incredibly difficult as it will be impacted by numerous factors such as the player's previous actions, board cards, the stack to pot ratio, and position. And that's why you'll sometimes see 30 minute long videos going over a single hand on this channel. In this video, we only briefly touched upon how to rationally differentiate between the weak hands we bluff versus the weak hands we give up, or the medium hands we call versus fold, or the strong hands we bet versus trap. The reality is that there's a whole world of complexity that goes into making these decisions to maximize your edge. And if you want to learn more about this world, hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more videos. 